and you know, I'm sure you have some thoughts on, on what you'd like to share with us. Would you like to start before we have, we have some questions from our students, but would you like to introduce yourself and tell us kind of what you do? And yeah, sure. So my name is Chris Johnson and uh, I'm, uh, we farmed uh, near Edinburgh uh, or by Garter. So you're probably familiar with that, uh, that town near Bayou. So that's where I'm from. I grew up there. And uh, Danny and I played basketball a little bit in the summertime together. Yep. So uh, but I started working here down in Houston, Texas at uh, the NASA Johnson Space Center. Down in Houston, we have what's called Johnson Space Center. There's about uh, seven different agencies for NASA around the country. Um, now you're probably familiar with the location where the astronauts launch or have launched in the past using the space shuttle. Uh, that happens in uh, Cal or happens in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center. But here at the Johnson Space Center, we work on design of spacecraft, and this is where we train the astronauts, and this is where the astronauts uh, return from their missions. In fact, Scott Kelly just got back last night around midnight here to Houston, and so he's been uh, rejoined with some of his family and friends, and uh, since he's been in space for a year, which is a, a big milestone, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, he's going you know, when, when a person is up in space, since there's no gravity, over time, uh, their, their body kind of gets used to not having gravity, and so they're not walking around, you know, and, and using their muscles the way they typically do when, uh, like we all do on, on Earth with gravity. Uh, and so with some of his muscles, uh, although there are equipment on the space station, up in space, to do, like, running on, bungee cords that will pull your pull your body down to run on a treadmill and things like that there's still it's very hard to uh to to do an exact analogy to the to the gravity we have here on earth so um he's gonna take some time to kind of reacclimate back to uh back to back to earth gravity and for his muscles to get back into shape um but uh so uh, so I've been here for 20 years down in Houston and uh, done several different things in the 20 years I've been here, working on design of spacecraft, um, and I currently am a project manager for the parachute system that we're building for NASA's next uh, spacecraft that we're building to send humans to deep space, whether to the moon or to the Mars. And so that. Spacecraft is currently in development. We uh, did a flight test last year, December, so a little over a year ago, where we launched from the Kennedy Space Center. And just it was a quick four hour mission. Uh, there was no one on board, no humans on board. It was uh, kind of the first test of this spacecraft, so we wanted to do it unmanned just to reduce the risk to uh, flying people. And that that test, uh, where we flew this Orion spacecraft, uh, it's a capsule-shaped spacecraft, went about 3,600 miles away from Earth um, and then came back to Earth and re-entered the atmosphere, kind of simulating the, the same re-entry speeds that the spacecraft would see if it were returning from the Moon or from the Mars. And that's important because the, there's this uh, thermal protection shield we have on the bottom of that capsule and we can do so much to test that on the ground here um, on Earth, but the only way to get a true test verification that that thermal protection system will, will, will uh, protect the spacecraft for the reentry speeds of 20,000 miles an hour blazing through the atmosphere is to actually go do a full system test. And so that last year's uh, test was really important from that perspective, as well as once it gets into the atmosphere, it slows down from 20,000 miles per hour to about uh, 300 miles an hour when the parachutes deploy. And that's where what I've been working on uh, comes into play. So we deploy a couple of parachutes to further slow down the, the, the capsule, the Orion capsule, from 300 miles an hour to 100 miles an hour. And then the next set of parachutes slowed it from, from 100 miles an hour down to a slow 
uh, landing speed of 17 miles an hour in the ocean. Uh, and then there's uh, recovery ships out there in the ocean that would recover the crew if there were people on board. So we, we went through all that practice uh, to, uh, to kind of get our first test on the spacecraft. And we have another one uh, coming up in uh, just over two years that we'll be doing that again with an upgraded version of the spacecraft that we're designing. And then uh, in two, two, two to three years after that, we'll be actually putting humans on that spacecraft and uh, going to the moon. Now we'll, we'll probably at that point just go around the moon, orbit the moon a little bit, and come back again, kind of incrementally stepping up um, our, our experience and capability to get back to deep space exploration to the moon and to Mars. So uh, it's pretty exciting and it's a good chance that one of you could actually be involved uh, in a mission to the moon or to Mars uh, when you grow older, if you're interested in doing something like that. Because we need good people like you uh, to be engineers and astronauts uh, to keep NASA moving forward. So. Maybe I'll pause there and uh, see if uh, what kind of questions you have. Yeah, right there in front. Um, have you ever stepped step foot on the moon? No, I haven't. Very few people have. In fact, uh, if you've heard of the Apollo program, that was back in the 1970s. That was the last time that uh, we were, or humans, had been to the moon. We have not been there, been back there since the 1970s. And so in the 1980s through uh, the 2000, uh, 2000 time period, uh, we transitioned to uh, building a space station that's orbiting the Earth. So right now, there's a, a big, large international space station that we have people on board, and they're doing science experiments, um, uh, technology development, and uh, so a lot of research, as well as what Scott Kelly was doing this past year, is we're also trying to understand the effects, long-term effects of uh, microgravity or zero G floating in space, what that does to the human body, because when we go to the moon or to Mars, it's going to be a relatively long period of time. Um, a Mars mission, it takes about six months just to get to Mars, and then a person could spend two years there and then come back and take another six months. So it could be a three-year mission for somebody uh, to go to Mars and then to come back. Uh, now for the moon, uh, we could it could be a shorter duration because the moon's not that far away. It takes on an order of days to get to the moon. They can spend however much time they want to there um, and then uh, return them in a matter of days as well. So that's what we're trying to do though. This spacecraft that we're building, that NASA's building right now, uh, will have the ability to get humans back to the moon and then after that also the ability to go to Mars as well. So it could be you, if you're interested, you could be maybe the next person to go to the moon. Or to Mars. Cool. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yes. Um, how long does it take to make a rocket? Like, long, long. How long does it take to, to make a rocket? Yeah. So, uh, we're building a, a new rocket right now, so along with the spacecraft that we're building that gets us to go to the moon and Mars. We also need to build a new rocket that can throw this spacecraft out into deep space. And so NASA is right now building this new rocket called the Space Launch System. That is actually being built uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, one of our other NASA centers. And it takes, it takes actually years to build the new rocket uh, to go through all the testing that we want to go through to ensure it's a, a safe system to fly humans on. Uh, now, once the design is done, uh, you can build a rocket a matter of six months, eight months, um, over and over again uh, to fly it. 
But the new rocket that we're building right now, it's taking, it'll take on the order of, you know, six years to design and develop. So it takes a lot, it takes a while. Any other questions? Yes. So why do you want to visit Mars? So there's a couple reasons. Um, uh, part of it is just kind of our human nature. You know, uh, way, way back when, before people had come to the Americas, you know, Christopher Columbus decided to come and explore. So he sailed across the Atlantic, which was, at the time, a very you know, treacherous trip um, with with the ships that they had back then, but they wanted to find out what's over there, what's over in Americas, and so he came over and explored the Americas, and we found uh, that the Americas are a great place to live and be, and so now you know we we live here in in the Americas, so it's kind of similar. Is we wanted to go to Mars to explore. We want to go, we've, we've sent some robots there, and we've done some science there with robots, but it's really limited what we can learn and until we send somebody there who can make immediate decisions on things that you're, that you're finding and that you're doing. And so it's, it's a part of exploration. But the other part of it too is the what we learn and the science that we learn. By, by going to Mars, we might develop a new technology or new knowledge that will help build something here back on Earth that would be helpful for us to even to live here on Earth. Um, there are many examples, there are many spin-offs, is what we call them, of technology that we have developed by developing spacecraft and by doing science um, that have been beneficial for here on Earth. Uh, just a simple one that I can think of is if you wear sunglasses that are that have a polarized or UV uh, ultraviolet protection on the sunglasses, that was developed when we were developing spacesuits, and when we put a guy in a spacesuit up in space, we want to protect their face and their eyes from the sun that uh, that can shine on them, and so we developed this protective coating that protects the radiation from getting in inside uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the suit. And that coating was then used uh, to put on sunglasses now to help protect you when, you, uh, when you're out there in the summer uh, from the ultraviolet radiation that uh, the sun uh, has uh, when it's shining down on you. So there's lots of different examples like that. So we learn a lot about new technologies that uh, that we can also apply here back on Earth. So in general, it's it's exploration, going and finding new things. Because um, one day we may find that uh, we can live on Mars, um, and it might be a fun place to stay. Uh, but in addition, in doing that, we learn new things that will help us here back on Earth. Who else has a question? Yes. How many years of college did you have to go to to be an engineer? So I had, I only had uh, a college an engineering a degree. Uh, it took four years at the North Dakota State University. Go Bison. <laughs> I went to NDSU and got my engineering degree, and while I was at school there, um, there are opportunities to go do what's called the internship or co-op. So when I was a junior, um, I took an opportunity to come down to NASA while I was going to school. So uh, during the summer, I went down to NASA here and uh, kind of learned on-the-job training, learned what they do here, and it was a good it was a good thing to, for me to, to see if this is what I really wanted to do as well. Um, and, but 
After I graduated from NDSU, I was hired here at NASA at the Johnson Space Center. So really a college degree um, in, uh, in engineering or science is, uh, is really all it takes uh, to work you know, at a place like NASA. I think I might be on mute. I can't hear. Right here, we have a question. Okay, all right. Go ahead. Have you ever met Scott Kelly? Have I ever met Scott Kelly? Yeah, I've met him. Um, I don't know him personally, but uh, the, the Johnson Space Center here in Houston is kind of like a college campus um, or like a school campus where we all come to work, you know, in the same general area. There's lots of different buildings. Uh, I mean, so uh, we, we see astronauts all the time. The engineers like myself see astronauts all the time. Uh, in fact, some of us engineers are help train them uh, because like an astronaut, when he's getting ready, like Scott Kelly, to go do a mission in, in space, there's probably a year before he goes there where we're working with him, helping train him uh, so he understands all the different experiments that he's going to be uh, carrying out while he's up there, as well as getting him uh, knowledgeable with all the systems and things on the space station that he needs to be uh, knowledgeable about to do maintenance on, um, in addition to uh, spacewalks. Uh, every once in a while, we need something on the outside of the International Space Station to be repaired, so he needs, the, he needs to be trained about how to get into a spacesuit and how to translate up out there in zero G um, and to fix something, use tools uh, to fix things. So we uh, work we work with astronauts pretty closely in the, the training that they do um, uh, before they go on their, their mission. So it's kind of like it's kind of like a campus, a school campus where we all kind of work together. Uh, we may not necessarily be working on the same things all the time, but uh, sometimes we do. Um, but uh, other than that, we, we still kind of walk by and say hi and things like that. Yes? Why do you like being an engineer? I'm sorry, what was that again? Why do you like being an engineer? Ah, uh, why do I like being an engineer? It's a good question, and I, uh, I have to say, when I was back on the farm uh, near Garter, working with my dad, uh, and we would be in the shop, and we would have to fix, you know, an implement or something that uh, uh, needed repair, so we could get back to farming. Uh, we had to use our minds to uh, figure out how to fix something, and so. I think that was that was kind of the, the development for me of, of that was interesting to me is trying to learn how to how to fix things and how to put things back together, take things apart, um, and so that was kind of my general interest uh, for being an engineer. So when I went to school, uh, that's what I decided to focus on uh, because it was interesting uh, for me. And because I like building things, I like knowing how things work, uh, and so building something and, and seeing it built uh, is 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 fun uh, for me. So that's kind of what I like about being an engineer. Yes. Is it hard? Is it hard to contact with the astronauts in space? A uh, good question. It's actually not. Um, not anymore. On the space station, uh, they have a, a similar phone system. It's different, but they have the ability to to call down to Earth uh, in, at any time and talk to uh, people. Talk to either work uh, people, co-workers, if they have a problem they're trying to solve, or if they're on their personal time, they can actually talk to their family uh, for periods of time. So. Um, with, for people, for astronauts that are on the International Space Station, it's, it's pretty easy uh, to talk uh, with people. Now, when you go to the moon, uh, because it's a farther distance away, uh, you can still have the same ability. It's just uh, sometimes it takes 
another 30 seconds or so pause where you're waiting for that signal to come back and hear what the person is saying and then you, you say something back and it might take another 30 seconds for that signal to get to them. So you still have the same ability to talk to people, it just takes a little bit longer uh, during that conversation. When you go to Mars, it's much, much further away. So the same thing then happens, but it even is a longer duration. It might be many, many, many minutes for you to get the signal and hear what somebody is saying before you can respond and talk to them and then they, they have to wait uh, to hear. So communication is, is easy. Uh, the farther you go away from Earth though, there's a, there's a, there's a longer delay in that communication. Oh yes, I have built. I have built things that don't work. <laughs> In fact, that's a very important part of engineering. When you build some, when you design something and you do analysis on it, the next really thing you want to do is you want to test it, and you want to test it in an environment where you're eventually going to put what you're building in. So we learn a lot when we go test something that it may not work, and so we we work the design to, uh, to uh, we, we use the testing to find out what went wrong, why it went wrong, and we use that knowledge then to, to iterate the design to ensure that it always works uh, as intended. So uh, I've built plenty of things that have not worked initially, but we use that knowledge to, to uh, tweak the design such that it, it will work uh, in the end. Yep. Who inspired you to be an engineer? Who inspired me to be an engineer? Good question. Uh, so I kind of go back to uh, working with my dad on the farm. Uh, you know, my dad, when things would break, we go to the shop and we figure out how to fix it, how to weld it back together, or if some new design came out on on a new uh, implement, we go figure out how to how to put that design onto an old implement uh, to have the similar function. So uh, to that extent, really my dad inspired me, my dad as a farmer, inspired me to be an engineer. What do yep. you eat and drink in space? What's that? What do you eat and drink in space? Good question. So. Uh, we eat very similar things, eat and drink very similar things in space that we do on Earth. However, um, because uh, it's it can be challenging in terms of uh, getting the food up into space, and we want to limit the amount of uh, volume and weight of food that we take in space, we uh, use a technique of dehydrating the food uh, uh, that goes into space, and then when an astronaut is getting ready to uh, to eat his meal, uh, basically you, he puts water back into the packet, and he may put it into a food warmer like a microwave to uh, to heat it up, and then he may just peel because it's because there's no gravity in space. You can't just like put things, slap things on a plate. And, and eat like a like a fork you know, or a spoon like we've on Earth, because that food would just go everywhere because there's no gravity keeping it on the plate. So they they kind of keep all their food and prepare it in a pouch, and then they'll just peel a corner of the pouch out, and then put their spoon in it and get a little bit out, and then surface tension will kind of keep the food on the spoon, so they can eat it in their, their you know put it in their mouth and eat it. But they kind of keep it relatively contained in a pouch uh, while they're eating it. Uh, but there's been a lot of work uh, here at NASA on making food uh, in these pouches, dehydrated, um, uh, making it so that it's very similar taste uh, uh, as it would be if you just made it from scratch here on Earth. Uh, but we do dehydrate it and, and put water back in it. Uh, in space uh, to be able to eat it.
Yes. Why did you become an engineer? What's that? Why did you become an engineer? Why did I become an engineer? So it really, uh, I, I, you know, I like building things. I like um, using my imagination to to create something, and then to be able to see that that something actually built and tested and then used. Um, that's that's I enjoy doing that. That that's fun for me. So that that's kind of why I like being an engineer. That's why, that's why I enjoy it. Good question. So, uh, because there's no gravity in space, uh, it's different than um, like in your bedroom uh, at home where you have this bed and, and you have a blanket and you get under it and the blanket, the gravity will keep the blanket over you uh, as you sleep. Uh, but it's more similar to camping, actually, where if you've been camping, and you've slept in a sleeping bag, that's essentially what the astronauts sleep in. They sleep in sleeping bags. And you can imagine, so if you put your body in a sleeping bag and zip it up, you're kind of, you're kind of like a cocoon. It's kind of a cocoon for you. And so it kind of keeps you uh, in, in where you want to be. And that, that um, sleeping bag will be Velcroed or somehow tethered to maybe a wall that's on the space station, and so the sleeping bag is kind of held in one place. And so, uh, basically, they're sleeping in sleeping bags, uh, kind of like camping when they're in space. I have a question. Yes. I read an article this morning where it said Scott Kelly grew two inches up in space. Is there any truth to that? And if there is, what's your theory on that? Good question. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, I don't know two inches is true, but I actually not sh sure. Let me say it this way. There is it's a known fact that when you're in space, you actually do get taller. Uh, and what's behind that is when you and I, when we're walking around uh, in Earth's gravity, uh, there's basically this, this gravity, gravity is keeping pushing our body towards the, the, the ground. And so... Our, our bones are always kind of being compressed, you know, all the time when we're walking, when we're moving around, um, and our tissues are always kind of being compressed towards the ground. But when you're up in space, especially for a really long duration, with that lack of gravity, there's nothing over just that steady long period of time that's keeping pushing your bones down and compressed together. So it's, it's I think the most likely or the, the most uh, the significant cause is actually the bones will actually kind of grow a little bit uh, because they're not being compressed you know all the time uh, as well as your, your joints everything just kind of is allowed to move in that direction uh, because of lack of gravity versus on the earth you're always kind of being everything's on your body kind of being pushed down all the time but it's true that in during a long mission in space that you do grow. Riley? Yes. When did you start working there? When did I start working here? I started working here 20 years ago. All right. Let's check out. Are there any more questions? Oh, you're way in the back. Nice and loud. How do you care? How do you take water into space? How do we what? How do you get water into space? How do we get water in space? So we we bring water actually to space. Um, we have uh, the same way we launch people uh, to the space station right now, which is with the the Russians. Um, we also send cargo, which can include water up to the, the space station too, like we send food. And, but the, also, uh, the space station has a system in it where uh, it also uses leftover water and, and uh, revitalizes it, cleans it, and to kind of reuse that water 
um, as well, which is very important, especially when you have a when you get to a mission such as going to Mars. Is we want to be able to actually uh, make water um, and not throw it, any of it away if at all possible, because that's a precious uh, resource that we need uh, for eating and drinking, um, uh, like at a place like Mars. Can you bring animals into the space station or up into space? Uh, we can bring animals up into space. Um, right now, <laughs> there's really uh, no pets that we have uh, bring up to space. Um, and I will say that the very first uh, astronaut, if you will, that the Russians, when they were um, developing the same capabilities that we at the United States were developing back in the 60s, they flew a dog uh, up into space. But uh, right now, we're really focusing on the effects on humans and doing science and, uh, and trying to avoid the, uh, having to take the dog out to go to the bathroom type of activities uh, keeping the focus on us and, and our human body. So we don't, we don't have any pets in space right now. Can you get hurt in space? Yeah. 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 Very. You know. Very similar to uh, on Earth. If if we happen to uh, accidentally rub our elbow on a sharp edge or something and get a cut, um, you know, those types of things happen. And so we have you know the ability to just like we do on Earth to put a bandaid on it and things like that. Um, part of part of some of the research and the science that we're doing on the International Space Station is to figure out also how to take care of some um, some larger problems that that can occur, um, like a, say a heart attack. Uh, now the astronauts that, that go into space are very healthy, and, and we don't expect um, situations like that to occur. But a part of again trying to advance our knowledge and get us to a point where we're comfortable sending humans to Mars, we need to be able to understand how to take care of things like that, uh, how to basically have a, a quote-unquote emergency room and the equipment associated with the, the things and emergencies that could happen uh, to, to a human up in space. So we're doing that now on the space station. Uh, in different science experiments uh, to kind of develop those capabilities to, to basically have a someday an emergency room uh, and the equipment involved uh, to take care of, of, of issues that could come up, health problems that could come up in space. Morgan? How do rockets get out of space if there's no gravity? How do rockets get out of space? Yeah. So uh, there are, uh, it, it's, it's very similar actually, a uh, rocket on Earth is, uses um, propulsion to basically if the force goes down this way, overcoming the, the gravity to push the rocket out uh, into space. Actually it gets easier once you get into space, so due to the lack of gravity, a, uh, a rocket or a, a nozzle pushing some fluid uh, uh, in a direction will push the rocket opposite that direction and because there's no gravity it's actually easier to do when you're in uh, in space. Great, we'll take your time for one more question. Is that good? Yep, that, that's fine. Have you ever been in space? That was okay. your, what you're thinking? Yeah. Is there a different question? Jager? How do rockets launch? I think we've kind of exhausted our questions. We seem to be asking a couple questions. Is there anything that you'd like to add? 
We've covered a lot of topics. Tucker? Can your ears pop in space? Can your ears pop in space? Yeah, do you know why ears pop? Are you talking about the, like when you go swimming and sometimes when you go a little deep, your ears pop and, and you need to yeah. kind of pop them to relieve the pressure? Yeah. yeah it's uh, very similar when you're going up in space as if you're also going into, into the water where depending on the atmospheric pressure uh, outside your body, you need to uh, kind of uh, equilibrize the, the, the pressure that's on your eardrum from the inside with the pressure that's on the outside. So when you go out in, in outer space, uh, similar to, uh, again, going uh, deep in the water, you need to, uh, what we call Valsalva, or um, kind of pop those ears. Or like if you were in an airplane, um, when you notice kind of popping those ears, um, uh, the same thing, same thing happens when you're going up into space. You kind of pop those ears, equal the pressure on the other side of your eardrum. All right. I think we better thank uh, Chris Johnson for joining us today. This was quite an experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.